Let's open in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word today, Lord. Help us to understand something more about you, Lord, and be able to put it into practice. Help us to be attentive. Help us to be alert. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, I want to look at the book of Ruth. I don't think I've spoken on Ruth. And it is quite appropriate because the story begins with a famine. And the thing about a famine is it threatens your way of life. A bit like a plague or a virus that is a threat about your life. And you have to decide and make decisions of what to do. And in the West, we're not used to people dying. It's not something we ever really consider very much. Often in third world countries, death is quite commonplace. And people are much more aware of that. So I'm going to start from Ruth 1. Um, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judea, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. You see, when something happens, it forces you to do something. It could be a divorce. It could be a redundancy. It could be one of those life-changing moments and you have to make a decision of what you're going to do and how you're going to deal with it. Fantastic as the vaccinations program may be, it doesn't answer all of the questions. So let's set the scene. A family in Bethlehem, facing a famine, decided to do something about it whilst they still could and move to the country of Moab, which is today modern day Jordan. And the Moabites, if you remember, are descended from Lot, who had an incestuous relationship daughters and hence were kind of outcasts. They weren't kosher anymore. So I think this is quite an interesting decision they made because it's famine, Jordan has food, the Moabs have food, let's look after number one, let us go to Moab get food and live. That is the decision this family made. And notice it says a man. It doesn't say many. It just says one family. Got up, left. Did they pray? Lord, is it your will that I go over to me? No. no. They just said, number one, look after. We need some food. We'll go. They went on their own. Nobody else in the town went. Do you know why? Because the people in the town were believing in Bethlehem that God was going to provide because God is your provider. Now they didn't have that revelation. And maybe, just maybe God didn't reveal that revelation to them because he had another plan. He had a plan to prosper them when they came back. So they went with their plan. Their plan was to prosper in Moab and then return. The woman's name was Naomi, which means a beauty. The fear had led them to a false perception, living by sight and not by faith. And it is so easy, especially today, to listen to the bombardment and start 
to see by sight and perceive things that are not there. Or, if you're at the front line, all you're ever going to see is the effect. So the perception is much bigger and it gets blown up. Either way, it's very easy at these times to have the wrong perception. But the people in Bethlehem trusted God. They walked by faith, not by sight. And you know, we need to walk by faith. Not always look at things that are, but we call those things that are not as though they were. We are led by our conscience through the Holy Spirit. But you know, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can still have a conscience. And you've heard the story about the cannonball, the cannonball who got depressed every day if he didn't eat somebody. You know, he was listening to his conscience. You see, you can be deceived by your conscience. But when it's connected to the Holy Spirit, you become led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just says, hey, don't go there. It's not good for you. Stay here. Put your faith on this. Now, if they had prayed, it may well have been God telling them to go. But let's do it with the blessing of God when we're called to go somewhere, rather than by sight. Luke 18, 8. This is Jesus was talking about prayer and communication. He said, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will everybody be so into science and sight they will no longer look for faith? But that God is looking for faith. He wants us to walk by faith. He desires us to trust Him and trust in His righteousness and make His righteousness our righteousness. You have to reach a point in life where you realize you're never going to be good enough. Doesn't matter how many good works you do, you're never going to be quite good enough. You're just going to come short. Even your best Sunday behavior is not quite good enough. And sooner or later, everyone will get to that point. You see, you can never earn your righteousness. You can only receive it. And you can only get it from the living God. This is what Almighty God, the Father, says about your good works. All of us, this is from Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are shivelled up like a leaf, and the wind, and the wind of our sins sweep us away. That's what our righteousness is like when we try and earn it through works. <coughs> you cannot see what God has done. You know, this is one of the things that I think I think is special about this church. And I also think it's special really about connecting with God. Is you see, you can read about, it. you can read the Bible from cover to cover. But it's only when you experience God in your life. It's only when you have an experience of the living God and you are humbled and then you have that revelation of Him and you enter that relationship and you get guidance of where you're going. That is when life becomes a living word within you. You have to experience God. And my desire is when people come to this church they experience God, something far bigger than themselves. Ruth was about to experience the living God in her life. She was a Moabite. Now, Naomi's dream of 
going somewhere. And also, you know, I'm just going to dive out a little bit. We sometimes have a dream, but it's not really God's dream. It's kind of our dream. God's dream is always beyond your wildest dreams. That's what the Bible says. His dream is always bigger than your dreams. And I've often found living the dream is always the dream. And I think Ruth, uh, Naomi, was really going to experience that the dream was going to become her nightmare. First of all, her husband dies. That's pretty tough. You've gone to a foreign land, you've lost your, hus you've lost your husband. You've got two beautiful sons. Jewish, good Jewish boys. Good Christian children. That worst nightmare to go off and marry into a cult, a Moabite. But they did just that. So then her two sons have now got two Moabite wives, Ophra and Ruth. Okay, maybe she liked them. Maybe she got on with them. Maybe her sons would bring them into the Jewish land and they could be converted. It's always that hope. But then one son dies. Tragic. A mother to lose a son. I can't think of anything much worse after you've lost your husband to lose your son. You have one son left. You lose that son. You now have lost both your children. All you have is your two daughter in laws, Moabites, Ruth and Oprah. And this was Naomi's response when she got back. And this is how she was feeling. She said, Don't call me Naomi. This is from Ruth 1 20 21. Don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara. Because your mighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. Your mighty one has brought misfortune upon me. Oh me, oh my. When things go wrong, who gets the blame? God. Did God tell them to go there? No. There's no way it said to go over there. It said, stay in faith and believe. It's easy to blame God when things go wrong. And often that's where people go. They think, well, I did everything you said, Lord, and then it all went wrong. But you have to push through that. God has a plan. You have to push through the pain, the suffering, and come out the other side. There is a place on the other side that makes you stronger and, give, and increases you. Have you ever talked to older people? I'm not one of them really. But if you talk to old people, you know, I'm talking really old people. Uh, they've often gone through a lot of pain and suffering in their lives. I know some of you have been through some suffering too. But God builds you bigger and greater and stronger. He is always getting ready to bring the goodness back and the light back into your life. And you have to hold on to that hope at those times. God loves you and he's bringing me back into his life. You see, when you blame God, you don't have to take responsibility. You see, it's a great way of avoiding responsibility. It's not my fault. I've done nothing wrong. I never do. It's God's fault. So I don't have to do anything. I don't have to face the fact that I might have made a mistake. I can just blame God. But actually, God is the one who's going to help you sort everything out and restore everything to you. Not just what you lost, 
but with a sevenfold blessing. Because that's the kind of God we serve. You never lose with God. Just like Adam and Eve, the first thing they did was hide from God. They were confronted. They played the blame game. Not my fault. It's this woman you gave me God. It's her fault. Oh, it's not my fault. It's, 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 it's this serpent. He deceived me. Passing the buck. But God wants us to take responsibility and when we're wrong, to go to him and ask for his help and forgiveness. And he's only so willing to reach out and restore. So willing to help you. The story behind the story, Ruth, is like a Gentile to us, trying to seek things that are right. And Naomi represents the pain of dying to yourself, of letting go of your dreams, your hopes, your future, and trusting in God. And I remember I got to that point and I thought, ah, oh, it's going to be so hard. Life is going to be just serving God, no enjoyment. I didn't realize that his dream was way bigger than my little dream. His world was way bigger than my little world. You see, you've got to see the story behind the story. Dying to yourself can make you quite bitter at times. Which is the name that she developed in Mara. She called herself bitter. Because that's how she felt. I like people being honest. Sometimes you have to be honest with God. I'm sad. I'm upset. I feel broken. I feel deserted. I feel lonely. I feel alone. God understands. And God will respond. So once you kind of give up your dream, you give up trying to do works, you begin to realize that you are righteous. You are righteous in Jesus. And it's only then that you say, I am a child of God. I am an ambassador in Christ. My self-worth is based on who I know and what he's done. Not in what is happening in my life and what I'm doing or what I've done. It's about what he's done. And you start being righteous. You are trusting in what is already given you by faith. It's only then that you start to become the person you always wanted to be. The more revelation of just how righteous you are and how much God loves you, the more self-worth you have. All of this is based on righteousness received from Jesus. Let me give you an example. When a Formula One world champion, Lewis Hamilton, gets behind the wheel of a road car, okay, and someone tries to race him across the lines, I love 
this story. I think it's an awesome story because I could be in a meeting with, with other pastors and ministers and a woman comes in, starts crying in my feet, washes them with my tears. I can see what the minister is going, oh yeah, where has he been up to? Where has he been up to? Then she starts drying my feet with her hair. Oh yeah. I can see them judging him, something chronic. And then she gets perfume out and starts anointing my feet with perfume. Can you imagine what everybody else is thinking? Was Jesus faced? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, Jesus said this about her. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. You see, when you get a revelation of just how bad and how sinful you were, only then do you start to realize how much you've been forgiven and the cost and how much love you have. And the greater the revelation, the greater the love, the more you can love others. Little forgiveness, little love. Great forgiveness, great love for everybody. She had revelation about her sin. And God forgave her like that. And not only that, he said wherever the gospel is preached, Room, this, this woman will be remain, uh, will be spoken about. That's how important Jesus thought that story was. And I'd love to have been a fly in the wall and been able to listen to all the Pharisees around him, their thoughts which were going through their head as this sinful prostitute was crying on his feet. I think that would have been awesome. And the fact that Jesus just was never pleased by these things at all. I think is another incredible, he was so secure in himself. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what people judge about me. The only person I care about is my father. And he could sit there in that room in total what we would perhaps be majorly embarrassed about, perhaps totally secure that I'm pleasing my father. You see, that's a kind of, when you get real revelation of righteousness, you stop pleasing people. You start, the only person I want to please is my Father in heaven, nobody else. And the only approval I need in life is not from your pastor, great that I could be. You want the approval of your dad in heaven. That's where it matters. And when you get that security, you can hold your head up high. Someone judges you. I don't care. My father doesn't. Someone said, embarrasses you. I don't care. I'm not embarrassed because I'm doing my father's will. And you can stand strong. You can hold your head up. But what about your past? Don't care. Father's forgiven me. Amen. What well, are you that simple? Yes, I am. That's why I love so much. You can turn it all the way around and be so secure in your love and your righteousness when you connect to the Father like that. Back to the story. Naomi heard that God, interestingly enough, had come to the rescue of the people of faith in Bethlehem because they believed and trusted in their provider that he would provide food. So she decided to return. I love this moment. I've had enough, I've lost everything, I'm bitter, I'm twisted. I've got my two in-laws, sister-in-laws uh, sister with me. And now I might as well just go back home. That was the plan. Let's go back home. Broken, empty. I went out full, I came back empty. So what she does is she says, well, it's time to go. I need to go home. So she calls them. 
And let's pick up the story uh, in four, uh, verse 14. So she calls her, her daughter-in-laws to her. At this, they went aloud again. Then off her kissed her, her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn away from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And get this. And your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if death, if even death separates you and me. I love that. Total commitment. I'm staying with you. I go where you go. This is the born again experience. The story behind the story. I now am going to live for me. I'm going to live for you. I go where you go. I ain't letting go of you. If you want to go back there, then I will go back there. You call me out here, I'll go with you. I'll stay and go wherever you go. Drawn by love, Ruth, a Moabite, was prepared to give up everything. She lost her husband. The future, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what God's going to do in my life next. I don't know what the next chapter is. But I know with Jesus, it's exciting. And I know his plan is about increasing my capacity to love. And because God is love, so as you grow, you're going to have <coughs> love in you for those around you, in your families, and in our community of faith, in our family of faith. It is letting go and allowing yourself to be driven by love. That's what Ruth was doing. Here, she was saying, I'm letting go. I'm letting go of the past. I'm letting go of all that stuff that's happened in my life. That pain of losing a husband. I'm going to let go of all of that. And I'm going to be driven by love. And right now, my love is within me. And I'm not going to leave her. And if I'm, I'm going to just follow her wherever she goes, and I will make her God my God. How awesome, awesome is that? I really felt that when I reached that point, my life was just going to be a servant, a total servant, no enjoyment, kill joy, no fun, just a boring life, perhaps going to church. No one told me God spoke to you. No one told me that God himself is life itself. No one told me he was going to restore and rebuild and resurrect things that I thought had gone forever. Could he give me that spark of living back? He could set me a light, I discovered. So Naomi allowed her daughter-in-law to come back and start to live in Bethlehem. Although Ruth's past was sad, and Naomi's past was sad, they just trusted God. She had come back to the land she should never really have left. But in leaving, God brought her back with Ruth. And Ruth, if you look in the uh, genealogical line, that's a good word for me, genealogical line, genealogical line of Jesus, she's in there. Wow. She's actually got her name in the, in the line of men. So 
her future now was totally unknown. And that's one of the things I love about the Lord. You never know what he's going to do next, how he's going to turn this situation, even if it looks bleak, he will somehow turn it round into a blessing. Would she remain single for the rest of her life? Would she meet a man of her dreams? I don't know. Do you know? You'll have to come back next week to find out. Would she be blessed? Would she have enough even? Would she be able to financially afford anything? It doesn't look good. In fact, I think she starts gleaning wheat in the fields. Begging was going to be her future. Or is it? Because remember that something has changed now with Ruth. Although she's had all this, dare I say, bad luck, all of a sudden she's now made her God the same as Naomi's God. She had changed. Something she crossed the line. All those things that were perhaps against her suddenly were now for her. And she made connection with the Father. You see, our God is a good God. And He's there for the living. He is a God of love. And He is our righteousness. Take out love. And you have nothing in life. Absolutely nothing. The Bible says we become clanging gongs. But take in love. And yeah, love does cost. It costs Jesus his life. But it's a great way to live. Giving our love to those around you. And I find the more you give, the more you get. And it returns. It returns. I mean, Pastor Sandra has done some things and repeatedly done them with no response for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden, without being aware of it, blessings have started coming back again and again and again and again. She's done nothing that new, but all of the things she did in the past have started to come back as blessings. Beautiful things. When you start to show love, you start to reap love. And there's nothing more important in this life than love. It's our motivation for us. And I want us to be a people of love. A people that understand just how much they've been forgiven. Just how much grace you have. So that you don't just love a little because you've been forgiven a little. You have an awareness of how much and everything that Jesus has done for you so that you can love a lot. That changes the world. It changes your world. It changes other people's world. It will, could even affect Naomi's world. But if you want to know, next week, same time, same place, we'll pick up the story and we'll find out. Did God bless her? Did she get her man? Was her life just going to be serving this, serving the only? Or was it going to be the most exciting life? And did she really get her name in the Lion of Jesus Christ? Let's find out next week. Let's get the worship to you. One thing the Holy Spirit, you know, I think it's a great thing to ask him. I often ask him for this, more love, just to increase my love. It's bit, I want more of God, but why not just ask directly because according to 1 John, it talks about God is love. So I want to just ask for more love in my life. Because love covers, love overcomes. Love is gentle, love is kind, love is patient. No one steals your joy, no one steals your peace at this time of year.
year when everyone's pushing and if we greed and fear and could I get this for Christmas? You can relax. I've got the peace of God. I've got the joy. I'll make time to get those things, but first I'm going to serve my God. And He'll make sure that all those Christmas things 